So the story of Tolliver is he showed up in California in 1903. We've not really been able to find much about him before that. And he was up in Livermore. And he had designed this dirigible. And his vision was his dirigible was better than the Zeppelins. He was going to compete with the Zeppelins. And he was going to build this 240-foot-long uh, airship. Of course, it would be full of hydrogen. And this was going to be for commercial purposes. He um, found some land up, up near Pleasanton that he wanted to use to build this thing. And he agreed with the landowner that if he could use his land, that he would drill him a well in payment for using the property. Um, he also found an investor, Phoebe Hurst, of the Hurst family. And Ms. Hurst invented or invested $72,000 in this project, which was about $2 million in today's money. Um, and he also sucked this Freck who owned the property to give him another $10,000. And he started building the airship. So here's the, here's uh, there, there were several, some said 240 feet, some said 250, this one says 270. 44 feet wide, 40 feet high, full hydrogen. Um, it was going to be powered by special engines that were of Tolliver's own design. Um, and it had a aluminum framework, and it was covered in Ponji silk and what he called paint which we would probably call dope today. Um, I don't know what punchy silk is, but I know it was some very high quality silk project. Some of you restoration guys may know what that is. Uh, apparently it was very expensive and uh, it, was, it was coated, it was supposedly uh, not porous at all, so it would retain the hydrogen much longer than, than other things that were used uh, by uh, the Zeppelin folks. So he built this darn airship and everyone was looking at it, watching it and watching it. And in 1905, he announced that the first flight of the good ship Toller would take place. And there was a lot of activity and everyone was ready to watch it fly. And nothing happened. For some reason, it just, the schedule was a setback. It just wasn't ready to fly. And Toller made lots of excuses why it didn't fly. Uh, but nothing happened. Next flight was scheduled for 1906, almost a year later. And again, everyone was excited, everyone was ready. They were ready to watch this giant airship take to the air. And then again, nothing happened. Uh, Tolliver called, uh, said it was for unforeseen technical difficulties. Of course, not really ever saying what the difficulties were, just unforeseen technical difficulties. And here was this giant airship full of hydrogen. Then he scheduled again in 1907. Another year later, the San Francisco Herald said, Tolliver's aerial craft ready for first flight. And the excitement was building. Here's the uh, newspaper from uh, April 8, 1907. And it's got a picture of the airship there. It says, Tolliver's airship is launched from a cradle near Verona, near Pleasanton. So they pulled it out of this cradle where they built it getting ready to fly it, and I don't know if well, I don't know if picture or not, probably. But you can see it's got a propeller on the nose, it had a propeller on the tail, and it had two on each side, and no rudders, and the whole thing was his design of these, these movable propellers to make this thing fly properly. Mysteriously, the gas bag was splashed and the airship did not launch and did not fly. Nobody knew how what happened, but all of a sudden it didn't work. You see a pattern here by any chance? So here's the San Francisco Call article from May 17th of 1907. And the headline says, Tolliver's Airship Joins the Down and Out Club. So people had finally decided that uh, this thing probably really wasn't going to work. Here's the, uh, the article from the San Francisco Call newspaper. Men who put money into the project are wondering how it happened. So the investors were obviously wondering where their money was and would they ever get their money back? Uh, because obviously this thing was not working. So the investors were 
obviously disillusioned. Phoebe Hurst was demanding that her money be repaid, but well, of course Tolliver had spent all the money, uh, and there was no money to get back. Uh, Mr. Frick, the landowner, sued Tolliver in court because he had not dug the well that he promised in his contract to use the land. So Tolliver did what any upstanding uh, person would do, he packed up and left. And lo and behold, he shows up in San Diego, of all places, in 1910. Here's a uh, monument that our sister chapter up in Livermore, is, at the Livermore Airport, uh, they erected a few years ago, many years ago now, I guess, to mark the, the, uh, the, the Tolliver activity up there, and here's the, uh, the verbiage of the plaque. Uh, and of course, it's the last line says, there were several ground attempts and the craft never flew. Uh, never seen anything about what happened to the craft, but Tolliver just left. So here's Mr. Tolliver and his ever faithful dog in 1910 when he arrived here in San Diego. Uh, this dog never left his side, he was always around. Uh, amazingly, Mr. Tolliver seemed to be quite the engineer person, quite, you know, and nobody really knows if he had an engineering background or a degree or anything, but his drawings, which I'll show you here in a minute, were pretty amazing. So here's a picture, this was off the brochure to sell stock from the Tolliver Aerial Navigation Company of America. And you can see the good ship Tolliver gracefully floating over San Diego Bay, you can see uh, North Island there in the front. You can see the two big props, one on the front and one on the back, and the, the uh, four smaller ones on the sides. You'll also notice there is no gondolas or anything hanging at the bottom. The actual passenger compartment is up inside the airship. And here's the, uh, we actually found the original sales brochure in an archive uh, for the Aerial Navigation Company. The verbiage is hilarious. It's that very flowery, early 1900s, um, talking about how this thing was going to be so wonderful and how it was going to make the uh, Zeppelins it would be way better than the Zeppelins and how safe this aerial transportation would be uh, and how you should certainly get in on the ground floor. Uh, the brochure says, the new wonder will soon set out on the voyage which will enrich her owners and make San Diego's name a household world word from pole to pole. Um, here's his board of directors. Uh, some of you that's been around San Diego for a while will recognize a couple of the names here. The first one is Burnham. And the Burnham family, of course, is still here in San Diego. Been here for a long, long time, real estate folks. So uh, Tolliver had him as their vice president. And J.K. Bell, who was a very prominent attorney in their law firm was in San Diego, he may still be in existence. I don't know. Miller Coyne, Miller Coyne, Miller Coyne, Miller Coyne, which is a big law firm here in San Diego. Here are the patent drawings. We also located the original patents that he filed. Um, the patents were applied for in August of 2010. They were actually granted in March of 2012. Uh, what made this difference, and you can see on the drawings here, where there's cables that go across the structure to, to, uh, to contain the, the frames for this, uh, aluminum frames for the, for the airship. And you look at the drawings, and again, the one there on the left, you can see the prop on the front, the prop on the back, and the two on, the, on each side. And here's the engines. So the patent drawings are kind of funny. They have a four-cylinder rotary engine. Uh, he ended up using a three-cylinder rotary engine, a 32 horsepower piece that he acquired. And you see in the drawing on the right, it has this, the system where the, it's really like a, a a CV joint type of deal where the, the prop could go up and down and side to side. And then the one on the left side are the ones that went out the side and they, would, they could spin 360 degrees. So if you wanted to go up, you put the prop on the top and it pulled you up. If you wanted to go down, you turn it down. And you could adjust the, uh, the propellers to make the airship do what you wanted to do. Again, with no rudders, all by props. He claimed in his sales brochure that if you lost all the engines except one, the airship would still travel 100 miles. And if you lost all the engine power, then the airship would gracefully descend on its own to the surface of the earth. 
So here's a, it's not a great picture, so you can work, but here's the, uh, here's the actual location at 31st and B Street up in Golden Hill. You see the little uh, pin there? It was just nothing more than a gully between the two, between the two streets up there, and there were, uh, in those days, almost no houses or other buildings in that area yet hadn't really been developed that much. Um, the location of our plaque is actually going to be further to the right. It's at the grade school that's past the next big green area and, and putting it at Golden Hill Elementary School uh, because there's a nice grassy corner there where we can put it in. If we put it where the thing actually happened, nobody would ever see it. But it's going to be a great spot right there in the corner of the school. So he constructed what he called the shipyard. So here's the shipyard at 31st and B. And they started building the airship. Um, you can see there's hardly any buildings around it. Um, they built a cover to, to keep it out of the weather while they were working on it. And um, as you can see, there are more buildings now because they built buildings so they could uh, make the hydrogen and uh, they could work on the engines and the other things that they were going to be working on to, uh, to fly this mysterious and wonderful airship. Um, here's the, the picture actually from the engine, engine shed of one of the side propellers. Um, these pictures are obviously really old, so they don't, uh, they're not great, but it's pretty good. So you can see the props of course. The props are just flat blades. They still had to come around and building you know, an aerodynamic propeller like the Wrights had done. Um, it's sort of interesting because most of these old airplanes from this time frame, um, a lot of these guys are still trying to use these flat-bladed propellers. And you can see that it has the angle and the, the engine is in the center. So here's the one dry shaft here, here's the engine, and then here's the other shaft that goes out the other side uh, to make the, the two sides. Here's a, here's a picture from Popular Mechanics even got told of this story. Um, and again, these, the pictures aren't great because they've been reproduced about 55 times. But again, you can see the props on, on each end of the fuselage. You can see the engine room and the, uh, the two engine rooms. And in the center, there's the passenger compartment. And then it was all connected with a, with a passageway that went front to back. And so you had uh, three engine rooms, or four engine rooms and then the, the passenger compartment. This was supposedly going to handle uh, 24 passengers and 16 crew. And here's a picture of the actual power plant. These were very expensive, actually, in this time frame. 32 horsepower, they have a big flywheel. Um, and it appears that the, uh, unlike the patent, where you had four cylinder engines, it actually ended up being three cylinder. And you guys will be upstairs and all know about and can't have, uh, or can't have even numbers on these engines. Gene told me once why, and I promptly said, OK. Uh, but they ended up being these three cylinder. 32 horsepower engines. So from May 11th, 1911, the first flight was scheduled for the new Tolliver airship. Uh, he had originally named it uh, San Diego, and then because his ego was what it was, he had renamed it the Tolliver One. So the date uh, in May 11th came, the date for the first flight, and that thing happened. The airship didn't fly, it wasn't ready, it didn't, nothing happened. So then they rescheduled for August, and supposedly Mr. Tolliver had resolved all the problems that kept him from flying in May, and they were ready to go, and they announced to the public the airship would fly in August. And nothing happened. We're starting to see the second pattern here. Of course, he had sold a lot of stock in this organization. Um, he started out 
uh, charging $2.50 a share, and then he had up the price to five bucks a share. And now Mr. Hogger was living large and, uh, and having a great time living in his nice house in Golden Hill. And, uh, so it was now rescheduled for October of 1911. And again, Mr. Tolliver told the world he had fixed the problems, they were ready to go. The Tolliver one was, this new marvelous airship was ready to fly and, and show the world the new history, or the new uh, future of aviation and, and flight. And then nothing happened. So now the city fathers here in San Diego are starting to get a little antsy. Because here's this big bag of hydrogen in the neighborhood. They knew it was dangerous, or they thought it was dangerous. Um, and they just weren't real happy about having this thing in the neighborhood. And it wasn't flying, it wasn't working, nothing was going on. So they kept telling Mr. Tolliver, you need to either fly this thing or get it out of here. And we really don't care which one it is, just it's got to be one or the other. So he, Mr. Tolliver, since he had raised the stock price and now was floating in cash, he decided he needed a chauffeur. He hired a gentleman named Hubert Lewis as his chauffeur for he and his wife. And this, uh, and Mr. Hugh, uh, Mr. Lewis also bought stock. He, Mr. Tolliver talked him into reinvesting part of his salary into buying stock at the Tolliver Airship Company, which he did. The problem was that Mr. Tolliver decided he really liked the equipment. Tolliver and Mrs. Lewis. Mrs. Lewis then filed for divorce from her husband, uh, Mr. Lewis, and was granted a divorce. And then Mr. Lewis turned around and sued Tolliver for ten thousand dollars for alienation of affection from his wife in civil court in, uh, in San Diego. So here's a picture of the uh, Tolliver one ready for takeoff. They've taken away the shed, and they finally installed the propellers, and uh, finally installed the engines. Everything's ready to go. And in November the 4th, they, they finally got the last of the engines. And the flight was scheduled for November the 10th, 1911, and the uh, newspapers and everyone had made big, big talk about, here we go, the Tolliver airship is going to fly. Tolliver gave the command to cast off. Nothing happened. Um, he claimed that the hydrogen was not good enough because the San Diego water was uh, was not good to make the gas. He had used 10,000 pounds of steel shavings and 75,000 pounds of sulfuric acid to make this hydrogen for the, for the dirt. Um, so he ordered 40 more drums of sulfur to uh, boost up the, the hydrogen to increase its lift capacity to make the thing fly. Now the city people were really not real happy. So here's a couple of the city uh, inspectors out inspecting this balloon and inspecting the whole area. So they sent the city gas inspector out because they were worried about this thing and he took a couple of uh, foot and a half, foot and a half cubic foot containers of gas from the balloon and took it down to the laboratory downtown to test the gas to see what the heck it really was and proceeded to blow up the city's testing laboratory. Ah. Now the city fathers were really upset. So they ordered Mr. Tolliver to remove the dirigible and the hydrogen immediately. Mr. Tolliver really wasn't ready to do that, but uh, he was facing the, the pressure of the city to do that. So he actually had contracted with a company in Los Angeles that had balloons, and they were going to come to San Diego with their balloons and lift the airship up and fly it to Grossmont, of all places, because that was outside the city limits at that time of the city of San Diego, and he could continue his, his endeavors with the airship. 
You might wonder why in the heck he went to Grossman. And I'll show you that in a second. However, on December the 20th, Mother Nature fixed it for the city. A big storm came through and basically blew up the airship and totally destroyed this crater. And you might say, well, I guess that was the end of the airship. But you would not be totally correct. So he tried to repair it, he tried to uh, reinflate it. The city kept ordering to stop and not, you know, not continue. Um, they finally said, look, you have till May the 2nd to remove it or we'll take it out of your court. By May the 20th, it was still not removed. But he had, he had acquired a couple of new investors to help him, and part of that would have been the money to move it to Grosswatt. Again, if you've been in San Diego very long, you will recognize these two names. One is Colonel Ed Fletcher. Fletcher Parkway, Fletcher Hills, Home Federal Savings, Fletcher Fletcher. Big family in, in San Diego. A lot of real estate. And a fellow named James Murray. Lake Murray, Murray Drive. Again, a big real estate guy. And somehow Tolliver, who apparently was quite the silver tongue devil, talked both of these gentlemen in investing a substantial amount of money to continue with the airship project. And then the plot thickens. So his chauffeur, who is of course now not employed by Mr. Tolliver, is divorced, he's broke, he's jobless. Uh, he's not a very happy man, and he blamed Tolliver for all of this problem, for his demise. So on May the 25th, his dog was found chained up to a house a couple of blocks away from the Tolliver residence, which was odd in that the dog never left his side. And on May 25th, Hubert Lewis came out of the shadows and saw Tolliver and his wife and my dog. And proceeded to shoot Mr. Tolliver and his wife 19 times. And then pull out a knife and stab them a few times just to make sure they were truthfully dead. Um, they actually survived initially. Mrs. Tolliver actually crawled into the house and was able to get to the telephone to call the police, but then expired, and so did Mr. Tolliver. Here's the original newspaper article from this day. Tolliver says, if I hadn't done it, or, if, or Mr. Lewis said, if I hadn't done it, someone else would have had to. To murdering the dollars. So Mr. Lewis was uh, arrested, obviously, and was found not guilty by reasons of insanity, which was sort of interesting. As soon as the trial was over, Mr. Lewis and his now not estranged wife any longer, she came back, disappeared from San Diego, never to be seen or heard of ever again. Um, as the executors were going through Mr. Tolliver's affairs, they found 800,000 shares of not issued stock in the Tolliver Aerial Navigation Company of America. And so ended Mr. Tolliver and his magic airship. So this is a booklet that we published when we do one of our uh, plaques right here. And I'm glad to see Gordon's here this morning. Uh, Gordon wrote the, uh, the majority of the, uh, of the verbiage in our book here and uh, helped a lot with the uh, history and, and all the things that we did to do this plaque. So this Saturday, we will be unveiling this plaque at Golden Hill School. Um, and this is in cooperation with the Air and Space Museum and with the San Diego Unified School District. Um, we're doing something we've never done before. We're putting a time capsule in the monument. And the students at the school are writing what they think aviation is going to be like 50 years from today. And we're going to put that in the, uh, in the monument. And we decided on 50 years because most of them should be alive still by then. You know, originally people were talking about 100 years. We thought that 50 would be better so that these kids could actually come back in 50 years and we'll be open it and, and see, see what they actually wrote. So I had their student leadership here um, a few months ago and we went on a tour of the museum and most especially we showed them the mural and what somebody else thought aviation was going to be in, uh, 
you know, 70 years or so from, uh, from the time when the mural started. So here's the plaque. Again, the County of San Diego uh, State uh, Historical Landmark. You can see the big star down in the lower left corner. That's where it is. Um, you'll also notice that on the plaque, it doesn't say how, what happened to this McCall. We decided that having on the plaque that he was killed in a romantic tryst with the chauffeur's wife probably would not make the school board too happy about having the plaque at the school site. So the book tells the real story, but the plaque uh, sort of leaves out that last little, that last little bit of uh, what happened to Mr. Tolliver. And you can see we've got the uh, Air and Space Museum logo on the Santa Unified School District yeah, who helped us do the plaque. And that's the story of Charles Tolliver. I want to thank Gordon uh, for all his work. Uh, we couldn't have done this without uh, him helping us. Um, I was going to read you just something real quick out of the out of the book uh, or out of the uh, the stock brochure, which is pretty funny. Um, it says just what. And just fancy what travel will mean when one looks down from this comfortable armchair at the elegantly appointed cabin of the airship and swiftly passing panorama beneath the constantly varying embroidery of scenery, earth lying spread out like a beautiful oriental rug, and oh, the freedom of it all. The chance to escape from the humdrum road and the dull, monotonous iron track, so that hither and thither it makes shortcuts and circle about the remotest peaks, and short to be, as the old saying goes, free as the air. So that's my story. So if any of you are interested in the book, I have them up here. We sell them for five bucks a piece to help pay for the publishing of the books. Um, and it has the, it has the sales brochure, it has the, uh, the patents. It's pretty interesting reading. The sales brochure is hilarious. Yes. Uh, has anybody ever seen those engines? Are they still around or were they scrapped? There is no record of what happened to all this stuff once Tolliver was killed. Uh, they were valuable, so somebody, I'm sure, got a hold of them somehow. I mean, there was ex executors that were, uh, you know, were appointed by the court to to try and, you know, what, uh, liquefy whatever was left. So I'm sure somebody ended up buying them, but they were they were expensive. Yes. Is that a variable pitch on those controls? No. All it did was move them. And again, it's the good old rotary, on and off, no throttle, that we're all used to on the rotary engine. So. so it's going this way, so the front, if you wanted to go down, the front one would tip down, that one would tip the back. After it would tip up, you'd go like this, and you wanted to turn. These props would turn one direction, these would go the other direction. The nose and the, the, nose and the tail would actually go sideways as well. So it was all all done by moving the propellers around, not uh, not changing the speed or rotors. Yes. So with Tolliver and his wife being murdered here in San Diego, are there grave sites here in San Diego? We have not been able to find one. If there are, uh, there were only a couple of cemeteries in those time frame. Um, so we don't know what happened to them. And we did pretty extensive research trying to find them. You know, in either Mount Hope or uh, a couple of the other old old cemeteries. No. Tolliver's wife, who was always with him, was who was killed. The chauffeur's wife was the one who was the mistress and who had divorced the chauffeur and was doing whatever she was doing. And then um, we sort of think just from the, the story that she was probably just collateral damage. You know, uh, he really wasn't after her, but he was certainly after Mr. Tolliver. Yes, Mark. There's a couple of people on the
Highland Drive, West Fulton Drive. Aubrey Barracks for Water and Bed Lands Point. Right. Are those yours? I'm not sure. Are they all looking at the same spot? I'd have to look. Yeah. There are other people who do them. Um, Sons of the Golden Pioneers, I think it's called, do some once in a while. Even the County of San Diego did a few uh, years and years ago. Uh, we've done more than anybody else. But we have, like I said, we have 99 now in San Diego. Group. Yeah. We have a lot of them. And of course, we, have, we sort of like the weird ones just by the nature of our organization. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Next one for uh, who's the speaker? Oh, it's the Coast Guard, yeah.